All right, go ahead. Okay, so um, I'd like to call the Finance Committee meeting of March 7, 2023 to order at 3 p.m. And thank everybody who's uh, able to be present, which I think is most of the committee, except for Bob, who had let us know in advance that uh, he's not going to be able to attend. Um, so I uh, need to make the usual announcement that pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 as amended, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who want to access the meeting uh, may do so via Zoom or by telephone. Uh, no member, no person in attendance, uh, excuse me, no in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Of course, this is a Zoom meeting, so there are, is no possibility of in-person attendance. Uh, but in any event, um, I want to also remind everybody that the meeting is being recorded, so that they should be aware of it. And with that, uh, I will uh, check to see that people can uh, hear me and be heard. Um, We'll start with Anna. Hi, everybody. Lynn. Present. Bob is absent. Matt. Present. Bernie. Present. Uh, Kathy. I'm here. And Alicia. Here. Okay, well, so thank you. So um, let me ex uh, just say on the agenda, we're going to spend a few minutes at the beginning to um, talk about, uh, just do a brief introduction to an item that we have uh, on the agenda again for next meeting. And um, that is the uh, compensation request that was uh, asked, uh, requested at the last February meeting of the council by, um, a, it was a joint request by Michelle Miller and Alicia, and of course Alicia is a member of our committee, so she's going to speak to it briefly. Um, I don't want to spend much time on it, but I do think it's important to get the introduction, and I wanted to do it at the beginning of Alicia's request. And uh, then I'll quickly see if there's any uh, public to make public comment and so we can get on to other things. The purpose is that so Alicia has the opportunity to introduce the topic to the committee. And then secondly, uh, I have some thoughts about um, issues that um, I think we need to um, ask Sean if he can help us or find somebody to help us investigate and see if other people have similar requests. So with that, I uh, want to turn it over to Alicia to um, make the introduction of what she and Michelle had uh, presented to the council and has been referred to our committee. Alicia? Um, yes, thank you, Andy. Uh, so I don't have like a big speech or presentation written up for you all. Um, I just wanted to present this. It was um, referred from the council um, and really just to explain a little bit the intent with this motion, um, we were looking to figure out uh, barriers to participation in public government and try to ad address those barriers in order to um, hopefully achieve more diverse, more inclusive um, council and to be able to sustain that moving forward. Um, so I'm really just hoping for feedback or input um, as to how, well, if we want to move this forward and if we can move this forward. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I think I'm gonna try and do something and see if I can make it work, which involves sharing the screen for a moment and then- uh, Indy, I can do that. Do you have uh, the presentation that was made 
and um, at the council, it's the enclosure in today's uh, packet. Yeah, I have that. SharePoint. And uh, for those people who, uh, who are not aware of it, there seemed um, there was a little bit of a uh, technical glitch as we went along. So it got added to SharePoint and put that to the web, but uh, packet, but Athena's it's uh, there now. adding it. Uh, she just added it now. And um, so basically, um, the request is you can see has um, three parts to it. And um, one is uh, counselor salary. And uh, second is uh, the family care reimbursement. And the third is health insurance benefits. And um, the reason that this is, uh, there is a time clock on this, but it's not an urgent time clock in some ways. The charter, provides that um, the, it sets the initial compensation for counselors for the beginning and then provides that any council can vote by majority vote to change the compensation for the next council, but it has to act within the first, first 18 months of its term. And since our term began at the beginning of January, then uh, it's really the beginning of July is 18 months, but uh, it was uh, impo uh, important to the uh, two sponsors that we be conscious of that uh, time clock. And that's why I was referred to the committee. And that chart that um, Lynn is coming to uh, was also a very interesting piece for us uh, in consideration because you can see comparisons that they obtained for other communities through research that uh, was uh, done by the co-sponsors prior to the presentation. And I think that the other thing that I just will note uh, sort of as background since I'm trying to cover this quickly is that the charter also says that in addition it has to be subject to appropriation. And um, the appropriation either has to be in the original uh, budget as we adopt it, or it has to be in uh, a subsequent uh, subsequent budget if we did a supplemental budget. But one way or another, it would, if it was done, it would have to be subject to appropriation. So I'm going to um, tell you what. My principal questions are, um, and then uh, see if anybody else has any. We don't have to identify them now. You can send um, any requests to add to the list after the meeting by an email, which should just go, it shouldn't go to all, but it should just go to me and to Sean. And the questions that I had was about health insurance um, is to, whether our health insurance plan uh, that we provide for our employees will permit it. Uh, and uh, I think that there's a whole series of questions that come there because it also has to do with um, our personnel policies and the policies of the uh, people in the uh, town and the personnel department who administer the health insurance and uh, second of all, the terms of the policy, as far as uh, for part-time employees, who gets covered and what are the requirements for uh, uh, copay for a, por for a portion. And I think that the, uh, if, if, if it was gonna be treated on the same basis, of other employees and any other factors that might be considered. And the second was in the end to try uh, and do at least a rough estimate of the cost of the request. So those were my thoughts on questions. If anybody has any that they wanna raise during open meeting, um, I see a couple of uh, hands up. So we'll go quickly through that. Um, but I, as I say, I wanna, limit this because I'm really trying to move us along 
to hearing from um, the, I, I the, the auditor and um, our actuary who worked on the uh, plan, uh, on the OPEP plan. Kathy, I can you. Yeah, Andy, I just want to point out, Lynn, I think, had her hand up first, but she she's ho can't, okay. she, has to, she has to do it with a hand. Lynn? Uh, thank you. Um, so in addition to the cost of each of these, um, all three of them, salary, child care, health care, um, it's really feasibility. And in that case, I mean, can we do it? And what is it going to, what's the trade-off? What can't we do if we do this? Uh, the precedent of any other groups have done this. And uh, does this impact the school committee as well, since they were part of the charter? Uh, and um, how many other, how many contracts does the town presently have under negotiation that are not resolved and are um, past the deadline of resolution? Great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Kathy? So I, Lynn covered what I would call the big picture, and I think we need all of those. So I have a only a kind of a small one to add, um, um, and I'll save comments on all of this for. I think that's what you're trying to do, Andy, when we get the information back. Correct. And can we do one of two things? Um, could any of the counselors who wanted to? take part of their, I've always thought of it as a stipend, um, not pay, um, part of their stipend and put it into a pool that others could draw on for childcare. Is that technically possible? That's a question. Um, if yes or no, can we do a rotating pool that we, I don't know what the right number is, but say $5,000 is in a pool for childcare. So people can come in person to a meeting. And we see, we try it out for a year. And if we did something like that and it wasn't fully expended, could it carry over to a second year? So the idea of a pool and could it carry over? So I'm, so it's, it's the feasibility of the pool rather than the specific number. That's it. Okay. But I echo everything Lynn just said. Um, I think this is actually a very expensive proposal. Yeah. And at this point, as I said, I don't want discussing uh, to discuss it. I just want to make sure yeah. that we get the questions. I'm trying to lower Thank my you. hand. Uh, Anna? Yeah. Um, Andy, I think you covered this, but I want to reiterate it just uh, just in case. My, I'm really excited about the first two parts of this, especially um, I think that those are really helpful. I think where I get a little bit stuck is when we get into the nitty gritty of health insurance um, or, or health benefits. Um, and so I'm curious to uh, know, Northampton went through this in 2014, um, which by the way, you know, that was a while ago. Um, and we are, they were, they were talking about the, um, the availability of health insurance to all their municipal employees. And so I'd like to know what our current uh, availability of our Health, health insurance and other benefits are to especially part-time employees to make sure that we're not privileging ourselves um, uh, over other part-time employees or other folks who work for the town. Um, that would be very, that's very important to me. Thank you. Thank you. And Bernie? Yeah, thanks, Andy. Um, I don't think the chapter 32B would allow um, elected officials to get health insurance unless it was open to all elected officials who receive a stipend or all elected officials. So that's a question really for uh, through council, town council, town attorney. Um, my recollection is you can't, you, you, you're gonna you're gonna open the door to every, um, every elected official. Uh, secondly, um, and I, I'm saying this as, as many of you all have uh, experienced the dilemma of being an elected official, um, getting a $1,200 stipend for, you know, weekly gazillion hour meetings and all kinds of other community stuff that we did as selectmen. Um, and I have a problem. Uh, I have a problem if we're confusing elected officials with employees. They're not. They are employees under ethics. 
but in, in, in effect, elected officials are elected officials. They don't get vacation time. They don't punch the clock. They don't get uh, tracked. If they never show up for a meeting, they still collect their stipend. Uh, if they do no committee work or if they do dozens of committee works, they still, still collect their stipends. They are not employees. So let's not go down that road of confusing uh, town employees with uh, uh, elected officials with town employees. It, there's, there's no comparison. Um, I think what I would see is that we look at the adequacy of the stipends that are paid to um, council members. And if council members choose to use those stipends to cover child care costs or cost of uh, elder care costs, uh, uh, then they're certainly welcome to do that. Um, it's not a it's not a salary that's being paid um, paid for service. So so uh, um, you know, and I also think we have to be careful about um, other elected officials and what ha what you know where they may want yeah. to. Uh, uh, one compensation. So I'll, I'll write that up a little more fully and send it off to you, Sean. Uh, Bernie, I, I think that the, the problem, unless it's framed as a question that is something that staff can look into and it's being um, other than you, you suggested one item that has to, that might go to town council, but otherwise I think we probably, um, or it's edging into debate, which I was trying to avoid. Okay, my, my apologies, but or, I, uh, I think that the question would be, um, why should we consider elected officials in the same uh, grounds as town employees? Yeah, uh, and I assume that uh, the only insurance we could offer, if we could offer insurance, would be through Maya, and uh, uh, somebody probably has to talk eventually to somebody at Maya, but... I think that the relationships and the health insurance piece with Maya are really through either Sean's department or personnel. Sean, and then I'll go back to Alicia and we're done. And I need to move on. Alicia can go first. My question's unrelated to anything. Okay. Yeah, you can go to Alicia first. Alicia. Um, yeah, thank you. I just wanted to um, respond to a couple of the things, the questions that Bernie posed. Um, and I guess I maybe should have spoke a little bit more to my experiences serving as a counselor um, in my opening. But again, like I wasn't very prepared for this meeting and I'm multitasking. Um, so it becomes a little bit difficult, but this, this is precisely the reason. Um, and so I'm not saying that this is not, this proposal is not to insinuate that counselors should be considered regular town employees, because if that were the case, then maybe we would have proposed hourly pay, which would far exceed the number in front of you right now, if counselors will pay, were paid hourly for the amount of hours that they spend on meetings. Um, I know many of you know, if you've attended a council meeting, that they often can go six, even eight hours a night. So that is a full, full-time job, like a full day of work for a full-time job in one day for a meeting. Um, and then also if you're adding on committee meetings, which for just me, myself, um, I'm serving on the finance committee, which can be two to four hours. And then also the elementary school building committee, which is an additional two to four hours a week. We're already working as much as working a part-time job. And if we're talking about inclusivity and making sure that people have the opportunity to serve the town, we have to talk about what that means for people who don't have the privilege of time or the privilege of wealth. Um, and so it really limits who can serve. So this is not about saying that like, it, it really is just about inclusivity and making sure that we're opening this opportunity up to a lot of different people because life looks very differently to a lot of different people. And as we all know, a lot of the world revolves around money and what people can do with their time depends on how much money they can make in other places and how they can support and care for their families in a town that's becoming ever more increasingly expensive. Um, and so that burden for people with children like myself becomes even more harder to manage. And so the idea with stipends for childcare or reimbursement for childcare is that at least elected officials are not taking on additional burden. And so I know at this point for me, if I were to pay for my childcare using my stipend, I would have already used my entire stipend. Uh, my monthly payment doesn't even pay for me to get a babysitter to, babysitter to cover 
all of my meetings in a month. And so now I am losing money. Like I am paying money to serve on the council. Um, and some people really cannot do that. And so then what does that mean is that they will never run for council. Um, and the, that does not mean we don't value their ideas or that they wouldn't be a significant asset to the town and to how we conduct our business. And so again, this is a lot about just making sure more people can run for council. And right now, the only people who can run for elected official are people who have the privilege of time or the privilege of money. Yeah, well, thank you. I appreciate your response. And I wanted to give you the time to do that because I, uh, since you were responding to other people. Um, but we do want to cut this up. This will be back on the agenda for the next meeting, but uh, I felt it was important for the sponsors and uh, Alicia's representing the sponsors to be able to start, um, at least introduce it to the committee today. Uh, on, I'll pull, uh, call on you and let's see if we can move on to the next item. Thanks, Andy. Um, Lynn, could you scroll to the top? I just want to make sure when we cost this out, it's in a way that's helpful to you all. Um, so the part one is pretty straightforward. Um, actually, one question I did have for committee chairs, is that just the four primary committees yes. of the council or does it include other committees like JCPC or budget coordinating group? Um, maybe a question for Alicia um, in terms of the intent. Yeah, it just was just the primary committee. The four the primary. primary council committees. Okay, yes. thank you. Um, all right, so that was question one. Um, question two was on the child, uh, the family care reimbursement. So um, I was thinking about this and trying to think. Um, so for the first bullet, reimburse councils for the cost of family related care provided during council meetings. So I was trying to think of how many hours to use. And as Alicia described, the hours can be volatile um, from month to month. So I was going to do, you know, two meetings a month at six hours a meeting. Does that seem reasonable for an estimate for? Um, for that first bullet under family care reimbursement? Yeah, I think two for uh, two a month for like a, a base is fine just for us to get like the An expectation, idea. like so that yeah. we can understand expectations, but yeah, but just to expect that that's gonna fluctuate. Okay, and then, so that's council meetings and I was gonna do something similar for the next bullet point, which is just general committee meetings. Um, I was going to do two a month, but maybe do four hours per meeting for that one, um, since the, they generally are a little bit shorter. Um, but I think in TSO, Finance Committee generally meets twice a month. Um, and then the next one, that one's pretty straightforward. Again, I, so I was going to do 52 weeks a year, five hours a week um, for that third bullet point of um, for planning for council related uh, council meetings. Yeah, I think all of those things sound like just about what I was thinking when I was calculating okay. as well. Okay, good. Um, and I think that might be it. Um, yeah, I think the the health insurance will, um, we started looking into a little bit, we'll definitely bring back information on that. I, I agree with whoever said, I think, you know, if it's offered to counselors, it'll probably have to be offered to all elected officials, but we'll, we'll verify that. Um, and I think the only other thing we were going to look at too is just make if, see if there's any retirement implications. Generally, there's other rules that you have to, ha other requirements you have to have to retire with health insurance, but I, we just want to verify there's, you know, whether there's any scenario in which a counselor could carry health insurance into retirement. So if there is, to factor that in as well. Um, but we will bring back uh, responses to all those questions at the next meeting. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. Uh, so, um, Athena? I, I have um, ongoing calculations, Sean, about um, council and committee meeting time when I mm -hmm. calculate time for, minute, for minute takers <laughs> oh, okay. um, for the budget. And I think the, the estimate for council meetings is probably a little too modest because we have special meetings mm -hmm. and and so on and sometimes there are public forums and forums and so on but i can help come up with an estimate yeah if you'd like maybe you said yeah if we, we can work uh, together on that one to sure um, good hey, and alicia let's finish up but i want to let you be the finish the close 
Um, thank you, Andy. I was just wondering if um, I was my question is to Sean, if he can also factor in the school committee, if it is, if it does come to the um, realization that we would have to include other elected officials, if that could be included in the estimates. Yeah, um, we'll add in just, school committee and, and library trustees if if it come, turns out that way. Um, there's there's also two other bodies to there's housing authority and um, Oh, the trust. Well, two is elected. Right. Yes. So if, yeah. So if any of those apply, if we could have those. And then um, my other question would be um, if you could also offer suggestions to how, like whatever you come up with as the estimate, how we could make that work um, using, I don't know, other things besides town funds, for example, grant funding or any other possible sources that, that, that this initiative could be funded from, aside from t viewing it as something that's taking away from other initiatives. Okay. Okay, and I think the last thing I can think of, and then I will move on, is that um, we uh, probably ought to check on what um, the communities on that chart, you don't have to go back to the chart, but what those communities that show that they're providing compensation if that's their current policy and because uh, they may have changed the policy since the information was obtained. So we'll have to figure out who's the appropriate person to do that little bit of checking. Uh, I yeah, I, I can talk with Northampton. I speak with my counterpart there. I actually have already spoken with them. I know that that's still their policy. So um, yeah, we, we can, pick a few maybe and just kind of understand how their systems work that'll I think help us with these questions as well. Okay, so I think, thank you. Um, I uh, had an agreement with Sean about time for this. Uh, so we would try and move on to the, uh, the two big agenda items. And uh, I just want to ask quickly, there's one member who's an attendee who's also a counselor and uh, so if uh, that individual, that counselor wishes to make public comment to the uh, this committee, uh, please raise your hand. And if not, uh, I'm gonna turn it back to Sean to do the introductions for the next piece. And I see no request coming. Um, so Sean, go ahead. Thanks, Andy. Um... So the next agenda item is our uh, review of the FY22 audit. Um, we have Scott McIntyre and Nadseya, where's Nadseya, Shakota? Correct me if I mispronounce your last name, please. Um, uh, so formerly from Melanson and Heath, um, Lanson and Heath has transitioned um, with another company and now they are technically called Markham, uh, but they have committed to providing the same service and the same, um, uh, just relationship that we've uh, developed over the years working with them and um, sort of the one of the benefits we've always had is they're always available to answer questions um, whenever there's something complicated that pops up or you know Sonia and, and Holly both do a very good job of being proactive when it comes to accounting issues and um, mm -hmm. and so we expect and they've committed to that same level of service so um, we're happy to have them both here to review the FY22 audit and we also have Sonia, a retiree in the, in the, as a panelist here, who um, when you see the management letter and all the bad comments, Sonia's here to um, address those uh, one last time. And so I'll turn it over to you, Scott, uh, to start walking the committee through it. Uh, thank you, Sean. Um, and as Sean said, I'm Scott, Scott McIntyre. I'm one of the principals here at, uh, at Markham. And as he indicated, he merged up with a a national firm called Markham. I can answer any questions that the committee may have on that uh, when we um, get done going through the audit. Uh, but if, um, with that said, I, I'd like to pop right in and, and Sean, you were gonna allow me to, to share my screen, correct? Yes, you should have, um, are you, do you not have access yet? Um, you should now give it a shot. In a minute, uh, probably when I do a little bit more of an introduction of the audit process, I'll. I'll then start to share my screen um, and you know, I'll start of course with our independent auditors report. But before I walk through the independent auditors report uh, and the financial statements themselves, 
Uh, I think it's very important uh, as part of an audit communication uh, to just give you know you folks an idea of, of how the audit process went. I think it's probably the most important communication you can hear from us. The numbers today shouldn't surprise anybody. They're your numbers. You do a good job with, with your numbers. I think the most, you know, the numbers are what they are. And I don't, again, I don't think they're going to surprise anybody. Uh, but so as a result, we think the most important communication is to just let you know that our audit of your June 30, 2022 financial statements went very well. Another way that I often categorize that is um, to let you know that as a result of the procedures we performed, we did not need to propose any significant audit entries as a result of our, our, our work there. In other words, when we came in there to do our test work, we found the books and records to be in good order. Key reconciliations are performed on a regular and timely basis. And all of the, that, that, that led to the fact that we did not need to propose any significant audit entries as a result of our work. That's actually one of uh, the required communications that we, we need to make to the committee today. Uh, two of the others include uh, letting you know that there were no differences of opinion and how to apply generally accepted accounting principles between the town and our firm. You know, sometimes an accounting standard could be looked at two different ways and, and, and there can be differences of opinion. Happy to report that there were no disagreements on how to apply generally accepted accounting principles. Uh, and the third of the required communications uh, deal with accounting estimates. And there are several your financial statements, uh, the largest of which are your net pension liability and your net OPEB liability. And associated with those are, I call them related accounts, deferred outflows of resources and deferred inflows of resources. Um, again, those are estimates, uh, but they are uh, you know, performed by actuaries uh, and they follow their own set of standards, just like we follow auditing standards, they follow actuarial standards. But there are some key assumptions in there, such as discount rates and things like that, that make this an, an, an accounting estimate. Um, I have I bring this up because it's part of the required communication, but I think that uh, as part of our audit process, we review those estimates and the assumptions, and, and we find that there are no significant issues uh, with, with the assumptions that, that you're using. Um, other estimates in the financial statements include things like an allowance for uncollectibles and the estimated useful life of, of your, your capital assets. Again, I'm required to communicate this to you, and we found no issues or no deviations from norm, if you will, in the estimated useful lives and, you, and what you've done from an allowance for uncollectible re receivables out there. Uh, with that said, I'm going to take just a second and, and begin to share my screen so that uh, we can begin walking through uh, the financial statements. And um, there it is. That should pop up in just a second. It should pop up to you, uh, the independent audit. Um, and I lost my camera there for a minute, so I need a second to, to find everybody. Um, <clears throat> I have some page references. I, if, if, if some of the uh, committee members have a hard copy, I, I will be referencing some page numbers, uh, both hard copies and, and the PDF page numbers. Uh, but the audit report starts on page one, which is page four of, of the PDF. Um, and this is what we call a clean or an unmodified opinion. Uh, it's no different. The, the type of opinion is no different uh, than it's been for, for, for many years. Uh, but it's still, it is the highlight. It's really, you know, to speak very frankly, it's what you pay us for. Uh, they're your numbers. They're your financial statements. This is our opinion on your financial statements. And what it says, it goes on for you know three pages, if you will. But in our opinion, based on the auditing standards that we followed, in our opinion, your financial statements are materially fairly presented in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles here in the United States of America. Now, I do want to point out, because I've, I've been asked this a couple of times in this audit cycle of June 30, 22 audits, this opinion looks very different than your prior year opinion. Uh, and it is but it says the same thing. In essence, our standards changed. And instead of starting with uh, the standards that we followed, it now starts with our opinion. And it gives you our opinion, our basis for our opinion, which includes the, the standards that we follow. Again, it's a clean or unmodified opinion, just like it has been in prior years. But some people have noticed that this looks very different and it does look very different. It's essentially what used to be at the bottom of the report is now at the top and what used to be at the top of the report is now down at the bottom. 
Nonetheless, it looks different, but it says the same thing, which is it is a clean or an unmodified opinion on your, on your financial statements. Following your, our opinion starts with your management's discussion and analysis. This is a great resource to go back to at a later point in time to understand why certain key account balances have changed. I'm going to walk through mo a little bit more of the basic financial statements and, and hit some high points. And I'm going to wind up coming back to a key area in your management's discussion and analysis that hopefully will uh, bring fiscal year 22 into focus and why, well, jumping ahead a little bit, why the key account balance that everybody focuses on, your general fund unassigned fund balance, why it changed. There's some great, um, you know, great statistics in, in this management's discussion and, and analysis that we'll come back to at a later point in time. But I'm going to go to page, print page. Oh. Um, I'm sorry, I heard a question, Mr. Chairman. Is Are you taking questions as, as, as we go or? I didn't. Did somebody? Uh... No, I think it was somebody that wasn't muted. I muted them. Okay. okay. Thank you. So I, I've hopped over to, to, to page 15 of the print or page 18 of the uh, of the PDF document. And this is your statement of net position. Now it's important to remember that there are essentially two sets of financial statements in, in, your, in your report. There's both a long-term perspective and a short-term perspective. This is the statement of net position is your long-term perspective view of, of, of your accounting and, and financial reporting. As I scroll down the asset side of, of, of this, you see it includes all assets of, of the government, including you know, your, your, your capital assets. And I, as I mentioned before, related accounts to pension and OPEB are these deferred outflows of resources. Now, on the long-term perspective of accounting uh, or financial reporting, people don't look too much at the, at the asset side of the equation. They really focus on the liability and net, net position section of this balance sheet. It's a, it, a statement of net position is just a fancy name for a balance sheet. And the focus for governments right now are really two, on the long-term perspective, are two accounts. And those are your net pension liability and your net OPEB liability. Um, I, and I know you have Parker coming on afterwards, so he can probably answer, I can try to answer OPEB questions, but Parker's probably way better at doing that than I am. But a couple of key things to, to point out on, on this pension liability and the OPEB liability. The net pension liability, and I'm going to focus on the first column of numbers here. That's your governmental activities, or essentially all of your governmental funds. Your enterprise funds are your business type act activities. To keep it maybe a little bit simpler, I'm just going to focus on the governmental activities. And you can see at June 30, 2022, your net pension liability had a, had a li liability balance of 30 million, almost 30 million, 30.6 million million dollars. That's down substantially over the prior year. A year ago, that account balance was about $42 million. Uh, and it's important, to, I think, for people to understand why that liability is down from June 21 to June 22. And um, you know that this balance represents your proportional share of the li liability of the Hampshire County re re Retirement System. Uh, and for the current year, <clears throat> uh, the, the discount rate that's being used is, is about 6.9%. A year ago, it was 7.1. And normally, when there's a drop in a discount rate, you would see that the li liability go uh, increase. In this case, we saw it decrease. It decreased because investment earnings for the year were, were substantially better than anticipated. It brings to mind that I think it's important for readers to understand that in your June 30, 22 financial statements, that $30.6 million liability is measured as of 12-31-21. Uh, county retirement systems in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, calendar year end, and it's permissible in your June statements to, to essentially reference a balance that was measured as of um, a year earlier, in this case, it's six months earlier. Why is that important? Uh, because through calendar year 21, investment returns were, were, were quite strong in the, in the system. And they beat expectations. When I say beat expectations, you know, you, you expected to earn roughly 7% and you exceeded that expectation, which helped bring down the liability. Now, I point this out because make no prediction of what this liability, what this liability will look like at the end of calendar 22. I don't think those reports are, are, are available yet, um, but I think it's probably reasonable to expect uh, that there may be a, 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 an offsetting increase 
in, in this liability that when you measure it as of 1231-22. Takes us to the net pension line, pardon me, the net OPEB liability right, right below that. Um, it, as with a June 30, 2022 balance of about $74.5 million. That $74.5 million is essentially unchanged over, over the prior year. Uh, and I'm sure Parker will talk more about this, but the fact that the, the, the number was unchanged uh, is really, you have to look a little bit deeper and it's, it's well laid out in his report. There really were a couple of things that, that happened um, in, in, fis in fiscal year 22. Plan experience had some significant gains, but investment earnings through 630-22 were not, did not match what the expectation was. Similarly, uh, there was a change in the discount rate from June 21 to June 22 that, that brought it down almost a half a point, which increased the liability. So all of the experience gains were mitigated, if you will, by the drop in the discount rate and uh, the, the, short, the small shortfall that you had in investment earnings compared to expectations. So a lot going on there. And I'm sure, as I said, Parker will talk more about it. But all of those things that went on essentially kept that liability unchanged for the fiscal year that ended on June 30, 2022. Um, pardon me. That's really on the long-term perspective, financial statements. That's really what most readers uh, focus on. Um, we think it's it's an important part of uh, understanding the 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 financial statements as a whole. Um, it's not always appropriate just to look at the general fund. We're going to do that in a minute. Uh, but there are these long-term liabilities that don't get reported at the general fund level that are important to to communicate to those charged with governance governance in a, in a uh, meeting like this. Now, I'm going to hop over to page, print page 18 or PDF page 21. And this takes us to the, the town's governmental funds balance sheet. And when I talked earlier, I talked about a long-term perspective and a short-term perspective. This brings us into the short-term per perspective for financial statements. And with even with the MDNA and the long-term perspective statement and that position we just looked at, most readers are still going to turn to this page of a document and they're going to look at the general fund and they're going to focus on the unassigned fund balance. And we'll get there in, and we'll get there in a minute. I just want to talk about a couple other things first, if I may. Uh, the, the first other item I want to talk about is, is this fund right here. <clears throat> it's your ARPA fund. Um, it qualified as what is known as a, a major fund because of the significant balances in the in the uh, accounts in this fund for fiscal year 22. Um, it meets the definition, as I said, of a major fund. So that balance sheet is presented in two pages from now, the corresponding statement of revenues and expenditures will be there as well. Um, that's new, new this year. Um, the column to its right, your non-major governmental funds, that's sort of a conglomeration of all of the special revenue funds, the capital project funds, and some, some permanent funds that don't meet the definition of a major fund get aggregated into that non-major non fund column. Um, there was one item, more item, I'm sorry, in the ARPA fund that I wanted to point out. You'll notice that the cash position of the fund of $4.7 million is completely offset by unearned revenue, a liability of that 4.7, and, and the fund has no fund balance, if you will, no, no equity. Or, or, or position that position. Uh, that really comes down to accounting standards uh, that, that indicate uh, that you're really not permissible to recognize the revenue until you meet certain exchange requirements. One of those things is essentially you have to spend the money before you can recognize the revenue. The money was received by the town and, and recognized in the, in the town's general ledger. Um, but accounting principles generally accepted in the United States say that this money can't be recognized as revenue until you spend it. So there's that matching between revenues and expenditures. So the cash is just completely offset by this liability called unearned revenue, and you will earn that revenue when you, when you spend it. So last thing I wanted to point out on the opera fund. So let's focus on, on the gen general fund for, for, for a minute. Um, and again, the focus is down here in the fund balance section. Um, you know, total fund balance of $27.5 million, almost $27 million of that is, is unassigned fund balance. And above that is your assigned fund balance. Those represents year-end encumbrances uh, from the general fund appropriation that are carried forward into fiscal year 22 and honored in, pardon me, into fiscal year 23 and honored in, in, that, in that fiscal year. 
Um, I'm going to come back to th th this this number here in a minute uh, when when I recap things with the uh, MDNA. But I think it's important to point out that this account balance of uh, just under $27 million is an increase in this account balance by about $2.2 million, a healthy increase to, to that uh, critical account balance. It also represents about 13% of general fund operating expenditures, uh, again, indicating you know, credit rating agencies like to see that you know, north of 10%, 10 uh, and, and you certainly have, have met that. Um, now, I think it's also very important for the reader to understand that this unassigned fund balance of $27 million, there's really two components to that. Um, in, in your general ledger, and this is very, very common, uh, you have both a, a, a general fund and a stabilization fund. For gap purposes or generally accepted accounting principles, those need to be consolidated into one fund. Everybody in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts accounts for them separately. That's the state mandated guidelines, but for formal purposes, formal gap purposes, they get consolidated in, into one fund. So if you look at that $27 million, and we, we'll, we'll look at it more closely when we get to the MDNA MD in a minute, but if you look at that $27 million, about $10.1 million of that is your general fund uh, in, in Sonia's gen, general ledger. And that 10.1 becomes the starting point for the Department of Revenue to calculate your free cash. The other part of it, you know, just under $17 million uh, represents your stabilization fund. And right now, or pardon me, as of 6-30-22, all of that stabilization funds was classified as what, what we refer to as your, your general stabilization account. It's set aside for the future, but there is no purpose constraints associated with that. More on, an, on, an, an, more on that as we, as we continue through. I do want to hop ahead to uh, two more pages uh, to page 23 of the um, of the PDF, and, and it would be page 20 of the print. As focusing first on ARPA, you can see that there's no change in fund balance. That's because of the matching, recognizing revenue to match the expenditures that are incurred. With that, we'll just hop back over to the general fund. And there's two critical things. There's a couple of critical things here to point out to, to, to readers. Uh, a lot of times the focus is on this third number up from the bottom. In other words, what did our fund balance go up by? In this case, it went up by $2.2 million, which essentially is the same as the, uh, the unassigned fund, fund balance went up. But I think it's also very important to look above the transfers in and out. We'll talk about transfers in and out in a minute, but I like to look, and I think financial institutions and credit rating agencies like to do this as well, that just from a revenue and expense stand, expenditure standpoint, you had revenues that exceeded expenditures by about five and a half million dollars. So now you come down to the transfer section of your statement of your operating statement of, of your general fund. And you see about six point six million dollars of that being transferred out. And over here in that non-major fund column, you see the money coming in. I think that's very important for readers to understand. I know it is for credit rating agencies because what's going on here is, I'm not telling any folks in Amherst anything you don't know, but you're funding some of your, your, your capital with your operating budget. It's being transferred out to a separate fund to account for the capital projects. That shows that the, the community is willing to, to finance some of its capital items through its operating budget and not always going to the open bond market to borrow money for capital projects. But that's telling the reader that the community is committed to funding some of their projects uh, with, with its own operating revenues. Um, it's equally as important, I think, to understand, and this is very well laid out in, in your footnotes, uh, this, this transfer in of about $3.3 million. And likewise, that's also coming from your non-major governmental funds. Uh, but I think it's important to understand which fund it is. You have an ambulance uh, revolving fund, as almost every community in the, in the Commonwealth of Mass does, and it generates a certain amount of revenues, and periodically those revenues get transferred out to for expenditures. In almost all cases, it's for financing of, of, of an ambulance. And that's what occurred in fiscal year 22. Two million dollars of this 3.3 million is being transferred out of your ambulance revolving account into the general fund. I point this out because a lot of times understanding What's coming into the general fund is very important to financial institutions and credit rating agencies. So I just wanted to make sure that the, the reader un understands that. Now I'm gonna hop all the way to the end of the report, um, focusing still on the, on the general fund. Print page 69 or PDF page 72. 
is uh, your budgetary comparative statement as your, your final budget, the actual amounts, and then a variance between those actual amounts with, with, the, with the final budget. And I'm going to drop down to the bottom. Well, I'll start a little bit at the top here. Revenues came in greater than anticipated by about $3.2 million. Uh, that actually exceeded fiscal year 21 uh, when you had about $2.4 million uh, in revenues that came in greater than anticipated or, or through the budget process. Last year was about $2.4 million. Uh, down on the expenditure side, the monies that were appropriated for the various departments for expenditures, um, unspent and un unencumbered amounts were about $1.6 million. A year ago, uh, that was about $2.3 million. Uh, and of course, the majority of, of this 1.6 is up here in the general government, public safety, and in, in education functions as, as well. So, uh, so collectively, the favorable revenues and favorable expenditures is a, is a, has a positive budgetary impact of about $4.8 million, the number I have highlighted there. Now, if we stop there, you know, if things don't make sense. You know, why did our fund balance go up $2 million when our favorable budgetary results were just under, under five? We have to look at uh, the, the amount of fund balance that was used during fiscal year 22. And, um, and, and that's, that comes down here, your use of free cash. You used $450,000, uh, for, towards your operating budget. So essentially, you're expecting your outflows of resources to exceed your inflows by about $450,000. You transferred about $2.8 million to a stabilization fund, and you tra transferred about $1.8 million for, 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 for capital purposes. So this $5 million here is a total use of fund balance, pardon me, of, of free cash of about $5.7 million. $5.1 million. Sorry, my, my screen where I see all you folks just went blank. And so it was, I, I got a little bit distracted there. And I, I need to take a second and just punch in my password. Sorry about that, folks. Um, so that I can see you as I'm I'm trying to communicate here. Um, so about $5.1 million, million in free cash that was used. You know, you net that use of free cash of $5 million with the favorable budgetary re results of uh, 4.8, and you have um, you know a negative $282,000. Now, as I mentioned at the top in, in your management's discussion and analysis, there's a great section in there that kind of shows uh, how things changed in your key that key account balance that I talked about, the unassigned fund, fund balance. And keeping in mind that net after use of free cash, the the impact for fiscal year 22 was a, a negative. 282,000. Now, if we go back to page 11 or page 14 of the PDF, you see a nice chart here in the middle. And again, this is part of management's discussion and analysis. And hopefully this is really going to summarize fiscal year 22 right here. I mentioned earlier when we were looking at your unassigned fund balance, that there are really two components to it. There's the general fund and, and your the stabilization fund. And total unassigned fund balance went up, you know, almost 2.3 million. But you can see the breakdown of it. You can see that the stable, general stabilization account went up two and a half million, and and the just the general fund alone had you know went down very small amount, but it went down by that two hundred and eighty two thousand dollars. So hopefully that just ties in how the budget versus actual page drives change in that key account balance that everybody wants to see of of, of unassigned fund balance. You do have to look at the unassigned fund balance in the two pieces that we've talked about, where there's the strictly the general fund, which is the starting point for free cash certification, and then the stabilization account. There is one more thing I want to I want to point out, and I won't turn to another page, um, but in the back of the report uh, there is a a note about a, a subsequent event, uh, an event that occurred subsequent to six thirty twenty two, and that is that. After 6.30.22, uh, the, the community voted, I need to turn to my, my notes here, pardon me. Um, after 6.30.22, uh, the, 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 the Amherst voted to transfer about $7.6 million of this general stabilization account to a capital stabilization account. I think that's probably a really, really important subsequent event for a lot of readers to know and I'm already going to jump ahead towards fiscal year 23 because 
I want you to at least understand what might what will likely happen in fiscal year 23 is that now that you've taken $7.6 million of general stabilization and committed it to a particular purpose, that purpose being capital, that stabilization fund will no longer be part of unassigned fund balance. Coming back to your, your general fund balance sheet, <clears throat> I indicated that this unassigned fund balance includes those two things, general stabilization and your general fund. Look, you have nothing up here in your committed fund balance. If stabilization fund is committed to a particular purpose, that purpose being capital, it would be shown as committed fund balance. So nothing else happens during fiscal year 23, $7.6 million of this account balance right here is going to be liquidated out of unassigned fund balance and moved up two rows on your financial statements to this unassigned, pardon me, this committed fund balance. Once again, about 7.6 comes out of here and goes up to the committed fund balance in the general fund. So if nothing else changed during fiscal year 23, you are, you are going to see your unassigned fund balance go down by about $7.6 million. But it, when I say it went down, perhaps a better or nicer way to say it, it just moved up the ladder. There are certain constraints on those monies now that the community is committed to spend those for a particular purpose. It's not as if fund balance went, didn't go down in total, your unassigned fund balance went down and committed went up. I think it's important for everybody to understand that because it's generally speaking, unassigned fund balance is the first place that all readers go to understand the financial statements. I'm sure as we, you know, as 23 comes to a close and the in the financial statements are put together, the management discussion and analysis for FY23 will highlight exactly why uh, that that unassigned fund balance. Again, I'm I'm unless of course you had favorable budgetary results of 7.6 million dollars, and you might, but everything else being equal, you can expect that unassigned fund balance to go down by about 7.6 million dollars, and it will be well outlined in your management's discussion in, a, in analysis. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my, my, my screen, and um, I'll turn it back to the chair. It was a, a fairly quick walkthrough of, of, of your financial statements, but I wanted to try to you know, touch base on, on both the long-term perspective and the short-term perspective and tie in budgetary results of operations with how that drives change in, in your un unassigned fund balance. Um, but I will certainly try to answer any questions that the committee may have. Hey, are there any initial questions from the committee? Lynn, were you? Uh... I, I actually do have one. Uh, just going back to your very last point, do you see that as impacting how, uh, for instance, we're rated for bond rating or anything like that? Um, I, I do not. Um, I do not think it would be seen as, as a negative, uh, quite honestly. It, it, it could be seen as, as, a, as a positive. Um, again, it's similar to what I was saying as far as when you transferred out, I think the number was like $6 million from the general fund to capital. That shows a commitment of the community to finance some of its capital with its own revenues. This committing of the unassigned dollars for that purpose would have the same attributes, if, if you will, to transferring that out to, to capital project funds, which is something that might happen in the future. Lynn, and if I can just add, thanks, Scott. Um, again, our policy is to keep 15% as sort of unassigned, which is really the upward percentage that the credit rated agencies look for to give you sort of maximum credit. And then anything above that 15% is what we're moving to capital. Um, in my experience meeting with uh, the like S&P, they really do sort of under, they try to understand the context and they actually ask you questions and you can explain. And um, again, to Scott's point, they use anything that shows sort of long-term planning, uh, they generally appreciate and helps improve your management score and, and things like that. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, and all I can say is congratulations on a phenomenal audit, Sonia. Great retirement present. It doesn't beat the chair, but it's um, but it's pretty good. It's my parting present for the town. Are you going to paper your walls with it? 
No. <laughs> no, I'm I'm quite serious, Sonia. It's a real statement. Um, I sit on audit committees and two for two other organizations, and this is like unheard of to see something this clean. And we owe you for years and years of great work and of getting us to these levels of standards and changing with the times, et cetera. Thank you so much. You're welcome. But I want to say you're in good hands with Holly and Sean as right. a team. Yeah. We, we know that, but that only because you trained them. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I want to thank you for the presentation because uh, you know, I think you started out with what was some, some of the key information about that these are our books and you were trying to make sure that what we presented to you was correct and uh, accurately stated and that you confirmed that and explained some of the key lines um, in uh, what we should be looking at, which I find very helpful. And uh, I'll try and go back and make note of it for uh, next year that I'll be able to even do a little bit of my own if I'm still at it. Uh, but uh, in any event, um, it, thank you for the presentation. I think it was very detailed, but very informative and very well explained. Uh, are there other questions from the committee? Andy, well, people are thinking of questions. If anyone is interested, again, to see any more detail about FY22, um, the quarter, fourth quarter report is on the accounting website. I know we presented it here, but if anyone wants a reminder how, you know, where we had savings and um, that led to the, um, you know, the increase in our, our fund balances, um, it's all laid out in that report. Yeah, I, um, I guess one question and I'll ask this again when we get to OPEB is, um, when you get to things in retirement and OPEB, assumptions get made about um, discount rates and um, the uh, what, what what to expect. And we're really in a volatile time as far as what interest rates are. And um, so I'm not, never quite sure where the discount rates relate to what's going on in the economy at large. Um, but I, so do you look at that to make sure that you're comfortable with the lines, the, 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 the rates that are being applied? Yes, uh, auditing standards require that we, we look at the, the, the assumptions and, you know, we look at them, you know, in, in, you know, comparing them to what's going on out there in, with so many other clients um, and do they make sense? And, you know, the, the changes that result, um, you know, they, from, you know, in both your pension case and, and your OPEB discount rate was lowered for fiscal year 22. Um, there certainly is a trend out there that that is, that is happening, uh, particularly in the pension world. There's some odd things that are going on in the, in the pension world, uh, pardon me, in, in the OPEB world where um, you know for those that don't have a, a, a trust fund they they use the 20 year municipal bond rate and what do you know and you know June 30 20, 2020 and 21 that just came way down June 30 23 it came back for 22 it came back up so it it caused some changes that don't always make that much sense but it is in accordance with this with the stand standard uh, but that taking a look at the key assumptions uh, is is a critical part of what we do. When I, I was just looking down at, at my notes, and if I if I may, uh, Mr. Chairman, one of the things I noted about pension was um, I, I indicated your uh, uh, your your liability is based on your proportional share of Hampshire County. Um, if you look at the Hampshire County funding schedule, it is presently, um, whereas of about a year ago. It was scheduled to be fully funded by 2032, so nine, nine years from now. And well, if it holds true, that means in, in, at the end of fiscal year 32, 2032, you know your your assessment you know could go down sig sig significantly. And I just want to 
I bring that up to add some perspective to the liability. That's the liability that went down a lot uh, from 21 to 22, but it's still, nonetheless, even though it went down, it's still a significant liability. So I also think it's important to understand that in context, you are, as all members of the Hampshire County Retirement are, you are paying down that liability through your annual annual assessment. And presently, it could change, but presently, uh, that pay down portion of your assessment to the county system is scheduled to mature in, in, in fiscal year after fiscal year 32. And if the discount rate goes down, does that extend the time before it's fully paid? Well, I think that would uh, that would probably require more of a legislative change to, to bump the period to fund it down. It would require legislative changes through the Commonwealth. But if you just drop the discount rate, um, you know the, the the annual cost may 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 increase. But unless there's a corresponding legislative change, it would not it would not automatically extend that maturing of the unfunded liability in fiscal year 32. And would that require more contribution from the town of the? Yes, yes, it would. Yes, it would. Um, you know, it, I don't want to, I want to be complete here, um, but I don't want to make it too confusing, but I, I, I feel that with that question, I want to, you know, raise the point that with 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 pension accounting, um, when when the current standards came out, GASB sixty seven and, and sixty eight, um, there is now a very distinct difference between accounting for the pensions and the funding of the pension. Uh, the funding is based on criteria X. Accounting is based on criteria Y. I could certainly talk about what X and Y are there. You know, and if you'd like me to, I can. It's probably pretty boring stuff, but there's the, the, the best way it was articulated to me a number of years ago was that instead of accounting and pension, accounting and funding of pensions being the same, they're now divorced. You have funding and you have accounting, and they're really based on a whole different set of parameters. It's all based on the same underlying data, but the parameters that go into measuring these things are different. I bring that up because of the nature of your question, um, but I also think it's just important um, to, to maybe add pers additional perspective to what this pension liability is. And, and Andy, just building off of your question, um, the discount rate certainly matters, but there's other things that factor into the, the schedule. I mean, the returns, um, um, there's smoothing things that the, the retirement system does to help um, buffer, you know, short-term impacts. Um, so there's a lot of things that factor into the schedule. Will there be probably some negative um, negative impacts from the recent drop in the you know in the stock market? There probably will be, but if it bounces back quickly, then it'll get a raise. So I think there's a lot of things that go into that schedule, um, and and it gets adjusted. They have an actuary just like we do that looks at. Um, everything that goes into them and they, they do a, a schedule going forward. Um, so as far as I know, they're still on track. Um, they, they may have bumped it out. A, I'm not sure if it's 2032 or 2033 at this point, but um, the good news is they are, you know, they are committed to fully funding and they've, you know, it's not, it used to be really far in the future. It's not so far in the future anymore. If um, you know, if the, as long as the economy holds up, okay. Yeah, I, I bring it up because obviously what, most of our time as a finance committee is put into is developing budgets and overseeing the, the budgets are being followed once they're adopted and making recommendations to the council on those kinds of topics. And if the requirement for funding for any of these retirement accounts, uh, either Hampshire County or OPEB, increases, then that money is set aside at the beginning of the process before we figure out what we have for other purposes. Uh -huh. So it is something that we ought to be keeping an eye on because as to what the trends are, because it really affects what we can commit to be doing uh, as uh, 
as a town through the services and uh, capital projects that we uh, think are appropriate. Mm -hmm. So I, I share that with uh, my fellow uh, counselors just so that you link back to the fact that there, this is significant stuff. Anything else uh, on the audit from the committee members? So I don't see anything, Sean. All right, well, mm -hmm. um, Scott and Isaiah, thank you so much um, for coming today. Um, and uh, if there's any, if anybody does have any follow-up questions, you can send them to Andy and I, um, and we'll get them answered for you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Have a good day. Thanks. Sean, you want to introduce yeah, so um, so the next topic is along a similar vein. It's our um, other post-employment benefits um, annual sort of actuarial update. And so we're required to do a full study every other year and then an update in the off years. And this is looking at the liability associated with our retiree health benefits primarily. There's a few other things that Parker will describe that are in there, but it's really what is the sum the town has committed or promised to all of its retirees, both both current retirees and um, and future retirees around health insurance. Um, and so Parker, who's a actuary, you know, does some very complex math to figure that out, and he's going to explain that now. Well, thanks everyone for having me on. Um, I appreciate it. You know, Scott pretty much gave all the highlights, so I guess this is where I drop the mic and walk away. <laughs> no, I mean. Uh, so no, I mean, uh, you know, again, thanks for having me out. And obviously the whole financial team that you guys have is what makes all this stuff happen because without all the data, we can't do anything. So I definitely appreciate all the help that they gave us. And if the question just came up about the pension thing, I would just tell you this, is that as I tell my clients, if I had to bet, I would take the over on the funding date only because 2022 is a bad year and their choices are to either, you know, increase appropriations or extend it by a year. I would bet they'll extend a year, but, you know, we can, uh, you know, take that bet another day. Um, but, you know, so that said, there's a lot of assumptions to go into these things. We'll talk about these. I'll share a screen here and uh, let me move this over here so I can see what I'm doing. All right, share a screen. All right, should be presentation. So hopefully you guys can see this presentation here. If all of those according to plan. Yep, we can see it. All right. So. We'll go through this. Again, I'm happy to go through the entire report if you want, but if you're 57 pages, I found most people like to kind of boil it down to what happened and tell me why. And but if you have particular questions, chime in anytime. Don't feel like you have to wait to the end. You know, whatever works for you guys. So I'll give you the quick 30-second overview on our firm. We've been around since 98. I've been doing this stuff a lot longer. Um, we work with about 500 municipal entities. Uh, we have clients in 37, 38 states these days, Europe, South America, Australia. I have an office out in Las Vegas that I'm at quite frequently, as well as here. Um, and that's enough of that. So this guy kind of said, what happened over the year? Basically, a lot of things happened, and yet nothing changed. Um, you know, you started the year with 84 million of liabilities, you ended with 85. You had 10 million of assets, you ended at 10.5. And your net OPEB liability, what most people call unfunded, went from 74 million 500,000 to 75 million 500,000. So really, a ton of things changed, and yet nothing really happened. And um, we'll talk about why in a second. The income statement in a municipal context doesn't mean a heck of a lot. I mean, if we throw this in here, just so you can kind of see what happened, but we're not doing, you know, earnings per share and bonuses based on that. So let's not get too hung up on it. But the service cost is the value of benefits being earned during the year by active employees. So if everything, if nothing changed, if everything went exactly according to the plan, your liabilities would have gone up by about $4 million, which is really service cost less the benefits you pay out, plus the interest on the liability. Now, things a lot of things change. They stayed basically the same, but all things equal, you go up by about $4 million bucks a year. So when people say, oh my God, our liabilities went up by $4 million, what happened? Exactly what was supposed to happen. That's what we would expect to have happen. Financial statement expense, like I said, we're not doing earnings per share. It doesn't really mean a heck of a lot. Your employer's share of the costs, these do include something called implicit cost. And I'm happy to dive as deep as you want into it, but basically what it means is the premiums being charged by the insurance companies do not represent the true cost of providing medical coverage for retirees. 
That is mainly for retirees that remain on active plans. So 62 year old retiree on average will use more medical costs or services than say a 25 or 30 year old active employee. Your, your average premium is based on about a 42, 43 year old employee. So 62 year olds on average are gonna use about twice as many healthcare services. So we need to adjust that cost for GASB purposes under OPEP and accounting standards. Uh, your trust contributions were up a fair amount this year. Good for you. So your net OPEP expense, which is went down slightly. The big one is the discount rate. Went from 680 to 639. This discount rate conversation came up a couple minutes ago about you know discount rates. And there's a lot of things to go into a discount rate calculation. Um, there's really five main ones I tell people. There's, you know, um, basically how much money do you go back a slide? How much money do you currently have? What are you paying out in benefit payments every year? How are you investing the money? How much money are you putting in each year? And then what are municipal bond rates? As Scott mentioned, they went up a fair amount from year to year. In your guys' case, given how well-funded you are, it's really based on how you invest your money. So you guys have a relatively, one of the more aggressive portfolios in the state. Um, in good years, that's great. In bad years, not so much. Um, but again, I would tell you, you know, Scott kind of hinted at this. In fiscal 21, you guys earned about $1.7 million more than expected on the OPEB trust. In fiscal 22, you lost about $1.2 million above expected in fiscal 22. So you came up short in 22 by a million two. You were high by a million seven in fiscal 21. So over the two years, you were basically right on the number. So I tell this to people so you don't freak out about going, oh my God, we lost money last year. Yeah. And guess what? The year before you made a lot of money and none of you were looking to go, well, we made too much money. We got to give that back. We didn't deserve all that. No, you have good years, you have bad years. Over time, they balance out. So again, over time, we're expecting you to earn about 6.4% on your money. Key thing to remember, this is not meant to represent any given year. So you know, you don't go, hey, well, we lost 12% last year. Why do you adjust your return? The return assumption has nothing to do with how much money you made in a given year. If you earned 25% last year, our discount rate would have still been 639. The two are not related to each other. The discount rate is basically the forecast is based on a survey of about 35 to 40 investment advisors about what they think each asset class is going to earn net of inflation. And then we, we take that into account and, and factor into you know, how, basically how you invest your money, basically. Um, so what happened? Well, as Scott mentioned, you had two really good things that happened. Um, saved about $15 million compared to expected. One is you had a lot of retirees that were previously in active healthcare plans that got out of those. Either you bought them into Medicare or they got into Medicare by themselves, however that happened. But for each active, for each retiree that remains in an active healthcare plan, that adds about $300,000 to your liability versus if they were in a Medicare plan. So it's very important to get people who are eligible for Medicare into Medicare when they turn 65. Also, healthcare premiums for the Medicare supplement plans, which is where most of the money is, went down by 1% over the two-year period versus the expected about 12% increase. So these are things that actually, I tell people, assumption changes don't change the cost of the plan. They just change when we recognize costs. These items here are actual real cash, actual savings. Now, on the right-hand side, we talk about things that went against you. We changed the discount rate. That increased your liabilities by $4.4 .4 million. But here's the reality. I can make the discount rate zero or 20%. The cost of the plan is the benefits you pay out the door. It has nothing to do with discount rate. Just like we modified our assumption for future healthcare cost increases, that added $10 million to your liability. Now, let's hope that healthcare costs come in cheaper than we expect. That would be great. And you'll get gains in future years. But we've been seeing a lot of 10%, uh, 11% renewals these days. And so we've updated our short-term forecast for higher healthcare costs than previously assumed. And again, hopefully everybody gets flat renewals. Nice big game. Sorry about the uh, microphone falling and all that fun stuff. Um, but yeah, so we're hoping, you know, hoping it doesn't come to that. We have to make our best estimates as of a given point in time. And as of right now, we're forecasting healthcare costs will go up uh, by about 9% a year for the next couple of years. So what is this big, Kind of assumptions we have, kind of like on the pension side, the discount rate it was 6.8. We brought it down to 6.39. 
that added about $4.4 million. What's the probability that everybody's going to terminate employment each year? Just because you hired Johnny or Mary at age 21, what's the probability they'll still here at 22, 23, 24? Okay, they make it all the way to retirement age. What's the probability they retire at 55, 56, 57? Okay, they elect to retire. What's the probability they elect to take health care coverage? What's the probability they elect to cover their spouse? Or are they married in the first place? And then health care costs, we mentioned. Actuaries make this thing far more complicated than it is. And I just say that up front. We have this 9% model, the grade down to the year 2060, where we'll get to 3.6%. And we factor in GDP increases each year and resistance bands. And we have all kinds of wacky things. The net reality is, if you came up with a single rate over that period of time, it's about 4.65, 4.7%. Um, so we have a lot of weird stuff going through there, but if you just want to simplify it, think about four and a half to 5% a year, and you'll be pretty much right on the number. In terms of the benefits, as you know, uh, Sean mentioned earlier, healthcare costs is what this is really about. I mean, there's a modest life insurance benefit. It's largely irrelevant to the, the equation. This $85 million, you know, about 84 million in changes on health insurance. So that's where the money is. Your average single healthcare plan is about $749 a month. Your average Medicare sub is about $352. I would tell you that compared to what we see in your area, your active plan is a little bit cheaper than average. Your Medicare supplement is slightly above average, but they're both within 5% of the average. So you're not, you're pretty much right on the number. The always important, how do we compare to everybody else in funding? You know, we're funding this thing. Why are we funding? How do we do? Well, you guys right now are at about 12% funded. That puts you guys basically in the top quartile, you know, about 75th percentile. 72% of people are under 10, 81% of people are under 20. Um, so right now you're about the 75th percentile, you know, plus or minus a couple percent. So you're pretty much, you know, doing better than most. Obviously you could do better, but you're in very good shape and have a very good plan to get there. And we'll show that in a couple of slides. So the obvious comparison to peers, again, you know, everyone has who they deem their peers to be. We just tried to pick some people of comparable size and hopefully geographically reasonably close. So you can see, you know, you're... Your discovery is 639. The state average is about four. You can see people here in the in the mid fives, depending on you know how they're investing, how much money they have, and the things I spoke about earlier. Um, service cost. I try to explain this to people in the simplest terms. It's 2796 per person. So the easiest way I tell you to think about it was think about Johnny or Mary works for you and they make fifty thousand dollars a year. They're receiving twenty seven hundred ninety six dollars in terms of deferred comp, payable as medical benefits in retirement. So it's really, a, it's a non-cash benefit that they are receiving. Your funded ratio of 12%, you're above the state average of seven. So you're doing well in that regard. Your per covered retiree cost is a little bit above the state average, you're at 6,000 versus 5,500. Part of that is because you still have 13 retirees that are over the age of 65 to remain on active plans. And that's gonna be because they didn't qualify for Medicare. They are almost certainly former school teachers who were hired before 1986. It never paid into Medicare. Um, that's a cost of doing business. I mean, unfortunately, that's something you got to deal with. Um, but again, over time, that will largely take care of itself. Not a lot of pre-1986 teachers who have yet to retire. Um, this just breaks up the service cost by bucket. Um, you'll see that public safety tends to be the highest number, not surprisingly, because they work the shortest career. They tend to retire earlier. So therefore, they have a shorter career, and therefore, if they retire earlier, they get the benefits over a longer period of time. So hence, they have a higher service cost. Again, it's not a big deal. It's just something people find interesting. And the all-important, what does the future look like? This question came about appropriations on the pension side. The difference I would tell you is on the pension side, those appropriations are effectively a bill, a legal bill. You get a bill from Hampshire County. You have to pay that bill. On the OPEB side, the payments are... I don't want to say aspirational, but they're not required. So you guys are doing it. You're doing a nice job and you have a pathway to basically be fully funded by about 2041. So you guys are, you know, making very good progress in that regard, you know, much better than many others. Um, but if, you know, heaven forbid in 2025, you're having a tough budget year, this $1.3 million, you don't legally have to put that money in a trust. You know, it's great if you can, it'll be well received by the rating agencies and it will Future taxpayers will definitely say thank you that you did that, but it's not a legal obligation. So there is a difference. 
Now you can see the liabilities over time go from 85 million to 300 million over the next 40 years. I encourage people to look over on the right-hand side. We put things into today's dollars in present value terms. So your liabilities go from 85 million up to 95 million over the next 40 years. So about 12%. You know, I would say that in the overall scheme of things, a 12% increase over a 40-year period is very manageable. Now your pay as you go, cash out the door costs, go from 3.2 million to 4.5 million. So that's about a 30% increase. So that is a bigger increase. But again, the plan will be fully funded and you'll be withdrawing funds in 2046, 2047. So the idea, much like a pension plan, once you're fully funded, this operates very much like a pension plan. Each year, you're going to fund the service costs and you're going to withdraw the benefit payments. It's going to look just like a pension plan. So really, in your pension plan, be fully funded in 2032, 2033, thereabouts, and you'll have a much reduced contribution. It will be the same thing here on OPEB starting in 2040, 2041, if everything goes as planned. And I can assure you, everything will not go as planned. I don't know what will go different, but people may live longer. Assets are going to do what assets are going to do. People are going to go to the doctor as much as they choose to. We're going to have multiple iterations of healthcare reform between the, now and then. Um, what happens with Medicare? A whole lot of things could happen. So assuredly, this will change. But as of today, it's our best forecast, given the laws in place today, the plans in place today, and your investment policy and funding policy as of today. And that's really all I got. Um, questions, comments, concerns? So I'm looking to others first, see if anybody else has questions. Kathy? Um, thank you for that. As, as you were talking, I was scrolling through the wealth of information you've provided us. <laughs> um, and so I, I just have two questions, and I'm yeah. not questioning the assumptions, but they yeah. matter for the conclusions. Yeah. Um, for I'm not sure why, but you have the total enrollment of in retirees um, going up to 2027 and then dropping back down. Yep. Um, so wondering why, um, you know, what, what, what are you seeing there? Yeah. And it, you know, since the number of people matters for the liability. And then yep. my other one is on way back um, your inflation rates assumptions. Health care trend, yep. Uh, the trend for medical care. Yep. Look great when I get out 20 years. And what leads you to think we're going to be in that world? Um, sure. Yeah. I mean, so as I said, you know, actuaries, this, this is a healthcare model. It's put out by the Society of Actuaries, good, bad, or indifferent. Um, and the basic gist of it, so I'll answer the second question first, and I'll get back to your number of people. So the basic gist of it is, and I've been doing this stuff for let's see, um, over 30 years at this point. Um, I will tell you that actuaries for the last 30 years and probably before that have always said, oh, in 10, 12 years, healthcare costs are going to hit some kind of a tipping point in relation to GDP. And at some point in time, healthcare costs can't keep going up with these rates because it'll envelop the entire economy. Well, we said that 20 years ago and 10 years ago and five years ago, and yet they keep on going up. Um, in theory, at some point, they hit a resistance level. Um, and that's the idea behind this model that the Society of Actuaries has developed. So basically, if you happen to be looking at our actuarial report on page 33 or 43 yeah, of the that's, PDF. That's the, that's the one I'm on, yeah. Yeah, so you'll see this whole thing about our general inflation is 2.5% a year. And then we have overall the economy is going to grow at 1.1% a year forever and beyond. Real GDP, not nominal GDP. And we'll have healthcare costs go up by 1%, 1.1% each year above and beyond the inflation rate. But the idea here is that right now inflation we expect healthcare costs to reach 21% of GDP by 2030. And we said once they hit 22.5%, that that's pretty much the point where at that point, basically it's going to go by general inflation and GDP only. It's not going to get an excess uh, marginal uh, re marginal cost above and beyond that. Let's put it that way. Am I 100% in belief that? No. I will tell you this, and I've said this for many years. I... Left of my own devices, my healthcare trend rates would probably be about 1% higher than what we show. Um, and I say that because I've been doing this for a long time. And 
I've been hearing the same story for the last 30 years. And, oh, no, it's going to return. Yeah, it's, it's never happened yet. Um, so from a purely, you know, much like Scott's world, um, we have to stay within generally accepted actuarial principles, much like generally accepted accounting principles. So I don't want to be on an island by myself with a higher health care trend than everybody else. Um, but if I was putting my money on it, yeah, I would assume they'll be slightly higher than what the, the forecast is. Um, just because I've been doing this a long time and it's always been higher. Uh, Kat, and, you know, Kathy, me- real quick, I'll just say, I actually pushed Parker on the other side. I said, our local experience has been better than the, the earlier percentages. You know, is this rate too high? Um, and he set me straight. Um, yeah, but I think we've seen locally our experience at times beat the rate and then we get a the nice thing when that happens is we get a nice positive adjustment on our opeb liability for that sort of one year um you know and we we just had several unusual years for medicare generally and every because uh people didn't want to go to the hospital (laughs) you know so you know the the medicare program got a few extra years of life or decades of life just by um, anything that was elective you you wanted to avoid because of COVID. You know, it was it was a, a trend. So it, it, it said both of those help us. You know, I'm not I wouldn't change this. And so my last my, so my other question is about people because fewer people. people. Yeah. So the, the, what happened with the people? So I was trying to express this in a more positive way. Um, so basically, we, for purpose of evaluation for our future projections, we assume the active population stays stable. So every person who leaves, you replace. But some people retire and some people, I like to say they stop taking coverage. It's just a much gentler way to phrase how our retirees uh, fall off the rolls, let's put it that way. Um, you know, because obviously with mortality, everyone's not going to live forever. And so basically, you have new retirees coming in and some retirees, you know, going off. And so you guys right now are still on the retiree side, still in the growth part of the side, the number of people, but that will, much like everybody else in municipal America, you guys are, have a very mature population. And in the next 10 to 12 years, you have probably half your population that is currently, half of your population is either at retirement age or within five years of it. So about 40 to 50% of your population will leave active employment in the next 10, 12 years. And so they're going to retire. But your existing retirees, many of them are going to cease taking coverage. And so over time, that will go up and it will start to level back out again. Because it's the, you know, it's the pig in the python argument. You have a big people cohort of your population that's moving through, but they will eventually you know, make their way through. So that's why we'll hit that spike and it'll start to come back down a little bit. It'll stay relatively steady, but it will come go up a little bit and come down a little bit. Okay, Andy, I have just one more, and then yeah, I. Sure. So, um, what we're doing and the decision, the way we're funding it, which predates all of the counselors here, you know yeah. that it's it, and I'm not questioning the decision. It sounds like what you're saying is we are pretty ag- aggressively funding this, um, and hearing that we might be fully funded by 2046 is, uh, I used to work on on this side of the world, uh, you know, when I say used to 10, 10, 15 years ago, that's pretty aggressive. If we weren't as aggressive, are there negative consequences to it? So if we, you know, on the amount we're putting in each year, um, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not doing a, you know, if we put in fifty thousand dollars, let you know something on the marginal side rather than you know. Park, Parker, stuff. I'm going to let you start, but I want to after you respond. I just want to add a couple of points to yeah. the, that question. I mean, you could okay. certainly uh, reduce your level of funding and stretch out the period. Um, would that be negatively received by rating agencies? I can't say you guys are in reasonably good shape. The biggest thing is to have a plan and follow the plan, whatever the plan happens to be. But the other side of that is what, you know, Scott was bringing up earlier on the pension system. You also have a pension windfall coming in about 10 years. And so what we see a lot of people doing is having a policy to redirect the pension windfall to OPEB so they can get funded quicker. So they would have a policy that says in 2033, when that pension windfall becomes available, we're going to take that $10 million a year and redirect it to OPEB 
and be fully funded by 2040 or 2038 or whatever the number is. So there's different policies to get there. It's not one size fits all. It's whatever works for a given community. The reason I think we see people doing that, and this is, you know, excuse me, and you guys see this in 2033 or whenever that time comes, there's going to be a bunch of people lining up for that, that big pot of money, you know, the, the pot of money at the end of the rainbow. And so the question is, if you don't put in your claim on the money now, somebody else will. And so whether that's somebody wants to build a new park or a pool or an OPEP plan or whatever it is, there's a lot of different uh, wonderful capital needs in the community. It's a matter of how you decide to weight them. Not my job. I don't have to get elected to anything. But these are the kind of things you guys have to think about. And so that's why I say it's, we see people using the, the pension money when it becomes available. Um, it wouldn't be a disaster if you, you know, cut it somewhat. But the problem, I guess I always tell people is once you start going down the path, it, you know, in case of emergency, you break glass. Once you break the glass, you tend to break it over and over again. So I yeah. always, you know, always caution people uh, to be careful about that. So I, I just quickly wanted to add, um, maybe not quickly. Um, so I wouldn't say we're aggressive, Kathy. I would say we're solid. Um, I would say we're not, you know, we're better than many communities, but I wouldn't say we're super aggressive. Our contribution has stayed sort of in the same ballpark um, for the last several years. Um, we haven't been able to increase it as much as we would like to under our plan. Um, the reason why it was a little bit higher this most recent year is because we we underfunded it the year before, and then we did a catch-up contribution this past year to make up for it. Um, I think the other thing I want to say is a couple other things I want to say. So we have uh, prior to Parker with our previous actuary um, just last year, we did do an analysis of how quickly we could fund our OPEB if we were to divert the savings from the pension system in 10 years um, or divert 50% of the savings. We did it. We ran a couple different scenarios with the actuary um, to show what the, uh, you know, how quickly we could fund OPEB. Um, so we've got that analysis that we're looking at and potentially going to update our funding plan around OPEB with um, that we can come back to the committee at a future date whenever you want and discuss that more. Um, and then the last thing I think I want to say is our retiree health insurance costs are growing really fast, right? They're, I mean, if you look at um, the school struggles, some of the town struggles, and you look at our retiree health insurance costs, you'll see it, you know, look back five, six years, you know, it's, it's gone up several hundred, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we're trying to fund it, right? Just like the pension system has grown, grown significantly, it's going to keep growing. And if we don't set aside an asset that can start to match that liability, it's just going to keep on growing. Um, and so when you look at the chart in, in Parker's uh, report um, of what our sort of annual expense is going to be, it goes up really high. It gets pretty scary, I think, looking down in, the, in those future years, especially if we don't do any funding. Um, you know, especially if we don't start setting, uh, continue growing our asset and, and growing um, our, our trust fund to help cover those payments. So I just want everyone to keep in mind that, you know, we are setting aside money and it's not for no reason. It's because we have this growing retiree expense that every year gets, gets greater and greater. Um, and that we do want to, just like our pension system, if we can fully fund that next year, I think we, then we do want to turn our full attention to OPEB um, because if we don't, then it's just going to keep growing as a portion of our budget. Um, yeah. The goal would be to fully fund both and then we'll be in a perfect place where we can fund anything we want at that point. But yeah. I just I just want to weigh in too, uh, to build on what Sean said. This is, uh, you know, the plan we have is pretty standard in a lot of cities and towns, you know, the where you're going to substitute the pension funds into the, the health liability. But what I have noticed with um, our bond rating agencies is that this is a, a an indicator of how disciplined we are in our budgeting. If you are really putting money aside, this they look to this as being, it's, it's not significant financially, but it is an indicator of how disciplined you are in your financial practices. And so we like to be able to show that we're continuing to make that con contribution to health insurance uh, for that purpose, because um, that's so important to us in the coming years, because we're gonna be borrowing a lot of money and our, our bond rating is gonna be so crucial. One other quick thing I would add to that, and this goes back to you know Scott's presentation, and you know as OPEB we are the problem children. We're seventy four million of that one hundred twenty two million on the balance sheet. Um, so if you're looking for a place to address, it's it's a good place to go. We are the big shiny target um, for all the all the negative press and bad things that rating agencies talk about. It's 
OPEB and pensions are one and two, and sadly, we get to be number one. Yeah, a couple things. One is, uh, I, I guess I have to, exception to the, uh, none of the current counselors were around when this plan was created. No, no, no. <laughs> I, 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 I take that back, Andy. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, because uh, it was finance, when I was on the finance, the old finance committee, way back when, and uh, Sandy Pooler was the finance director and John Musanti was the town manager. We actually sort of developed the plan back then. And I think that there were reasons that we did, because I remember those discussions uh, pretty well. Uh, you know, the what we were doing up until that point was pay as you go. And pay as you go is, uh, a disaster um, as you as the farther out you go, the bigger the disaster. And what happens is that uh, there will come a time when, if we have um, a responsibility to the town's future as well as to its present, um, at some point the town will be able to afford to do nothing. Um, another discussion that I recall is, at least at that time, it was unclear whether um, the Gatsby standards were going to require that we showed the total OPEB liability as a liability on the balance sheets. And it sort of got around it by saying, well, no, you tell them the number in a footnote, but you don't have to put it in the balance sheet, and that certainly helped us in the end feel better about it. Uh, but in the end, uh, what we also recognized, and I think it was what uh, uh, Paul was alluding to, John, is that um, if we stayed totally on pay as you go, I think that we were convinced at that time, and I think still are, I still think it's right that it was going to um, negatively impact our S and P rating and drive up our borrowing costs. So there's a lot in this um, whole OPEB question that, um, uh, and, and a lot of history to it. But I'm going to stop talking and recognize Lynn. So uh, you can thank the baby boomers for the recent increase. We we all decided to retire out. Um, and we are a big bubble. <laughs> uh, so uh, these are two historic questions. How did we get here? And who bankrolls this? You say, how did we get here? Do you mean by this, this plan in itself, you mean? No, how did we get to the point we had this liability? Is it because we were just doing pay as you go? Well, well, yes and no. I mean, it's much like, I guess, let's, let's back up. In the 1950s and thereabouts, when people put these plans into place, mm -hmm. healthcare costs are very cheap. Oh, we'll give people benefits. It only cost $10 a month. Who cares? It's tiny money. And so you made promises without knowing what the ultimate cost was because it was cheap. Who cares? It's no big deal. And under 32B, you know, the ongoing joke is it's like the Roach Motel. You can check in, you can't check out. Once you decide to adopt the benefits, you've got the benefits. Unlike my other states where you can walk away and say, no, we don't want to do this anymore. Not in Massachusetts. Once you decide to come in, you're, you're in. Right. And so you had the benefits. Well, in the pension system, it was also pay as you go until 1985 when they said, hey, we got to do something about that. And they started addressing that. On the OPEB side, in a perfect world, when these plans were set up in the 50s, people would have been funding them back in the 50s. They didn't. And so you guys started funding probably in, 2008, 2009, thereabouts. Um, but that meant you were, you know, 50 years behind schedule. And so you've got a giant hole to dig out of. And unfortunately, you can't go back and assess the taxpayers in 1962 and 1972 and 1982 and say, hey, you got services in these years. Here's your bill. That can't happen. So unfortunately, today's taxpayers have to pay today's cost plus some pro rata share of the prior cost. That's 74 million of unfunded. So that's unfortunately where we are. That's how we get here. But yeah, it was pay as you go for a very long time. And unfortunately, healthcare costs have gone up by many, many percentage over the last 40, 50, 60 years. 
And so that's kind of really how we get here. And to the earlier comment uh, about, you know, Gasby and said, you know, Gasby 45 came out and said, hey, you don't have to put it on the balance sheet, put it in the footnote. Great. And then we come with Gasby 75 says, yeah, forget about that. You're putting it on the balance sheet. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, ultimately, as I used to tell clients back in Gasby 45, I would tell them, guys, people buying your bonds aren't stupid. They know how to flip to the disclosure section. They can find the number. It's not a big deal whether it's on your balance sheet or not in your balance sheet. It's exactly the same thing. So it doesn't change anything there. But yeah, I mean, but the other side of this, you know, the title together is the advantage of funding. Gasby can't make you do anything, but in a sense, they make you do it by, I don't call it peer pressure, but it almost is. If you're funding, you get a better bond rating and therefore you get to borrow cheaper. If you decided, hey, we don't want to fund. Well, guess what? Your $86 million liability now goes to $120 million to reason the municipal bond rate. And now your bond rating goes down. So now it becomes more expensive to borrow. So you go, well, I can put a million dollars in the trust fund every year. Or since we borrow money, I can pay an extra million dollars in interest costs to my borrowers. <laughs> and my liability is still there. So it's almost like you have to put the money in because it's cheaper to put the money in is than it is not to put the money in. So that's kind of how we got here. I think there was a second question there that I may have ignored. Who bankrolls us? Your taxpayers. Your, okay. I mean, that's that's right. ultimately it's got to come up with the money. I mean, and that's why I think going to, to Sean's earlier comment, you're taking care of today's taxpayers, but also the future taxpayers. Because if you yeah. don't, these costs are going to escalate many times over over the years. And at some point in time, you end up like Jefferson County, Alabama, or Detroit, or Sacramento, and you go, guess what, guys? We can't pay the bills. Right. Um, the number comes due, and, and the money's not there. And so you guys are trying to be responsible by setting the money aside and planning for the future rather than just, you know, I give the example all the time about Congress and we have all this stuff going on now is, you know, 10 years from now, they're going to come up and say, oh my God, Social Security is bankrupt. We never saw this coming. What are we going to do? And then they will do something. Before then, they will do nothing. Right. And I say that because we've all known since 1991 or thereabouts exactly what's going to happen in 2034, 2035. Not news. It's basic math. Hasn't done anything yet. And based on the last, we did it in 83, we're going to wait for the crisis and then we're going to do something. And so that's why I say you guys are being responsible by doing things now rather than waiting for the crisis to hit. I mean, I, if it makes anybody feel any better, I chair the audit committee for the Girl Scouts of Central and Western Mass and the Girl Scouts nationwide. When they did consolidation, they ended up with a huge uh, payback that, that they're now doing over time on their retirement funds and it's it's a mess it's so thank you I'm, i appreciate yeah. it um andy i also want to just point out that we have another person in the audience and you did a public comment earlier and bernie yep. hasn't and bernie has yeah, bernie is a stand up Bernie will be uncharacteristically brief. Um, <laughs> I, I think um, we got a lot of we got a lot of good news in these two reports. And the good news is is that we're we're disciplined and we're consistent, and that's a rarity I think in government systems, not just local governments but governments in general. And so we're 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 being very careful about not crowding out how we can spend our money in the future. And really trying to to to, to manage things for for uh, for future taxpayers. And as John Maynard Keynes said, in the long run, we're all dead. Someone will have to show up and pay the bills. We're trying to take care of that. So I, um, you know, my thanks to uh, my thanks to our our presenters this afternoon, and to our staff for their carefulness. Thank you. Yeah. So other questions, um, one, one of that I have is just a, you, you made a presentation using slides that were different from the present, from the report we received in advance. Can you provide the slides to Sean so that we have them available for the committee for future use? Yeah, yeah. Parker, you may have sent them. I'll, I'll double check, but if not. I'll, I'll send them in two seconds. Yeah, when we get off okay. call, I'll send them right away. Thank you. Okay. Like I said, I just generally boil it down to that because I go through 57 pages, people zone out after about page four, and I go, it's like, I would just boil it down to stuff people actually care about. 
Yeah, no, I th thought it was very Thank helpful. You. And I appreciated that very much. Are, is the requirement now to do actuarial studies annually? Because I noticed it did in two years. We, we contracted for two year increments. Yeah, um, it's yes and no. I mean, there's a full study done every two years, and there's a roll forward in the in between year. So in fiscal 23, we're going to roll forward all the numbers and update the assets and update the benefit payments and things like that. But it's not, we're not gathering all the information again. It's a, it's a much simpler process. It's really update the discount rate and update the assets. It's a, it's a much simpler process. And my last question is uh, late in the report and in what you talked in, in your presentation, you talked about assumptions. Yep. And I, I gather that those are assumptions that you and your company make from your experience in the area that they're not coming from an outside source? Yes and no. I mean, so certain assumptions, so for example, certain assumptions that are that would be used on the pension plan, we're going to use the same assumptions for well, two reasons. One is they're using the same assumptions that came from PARAC, which is the state. Um, and the reason for that really is it's tough for me to say that for OPEP purposes, people are going to terminate employment or die or whatever at a certain rate, but in the pension plan, they're going to live longer or shorter. So we want to make sure we're consistent between the two plans. But on the PARAC side, so the state does experience studies every five years, basically, across all municipal employees across the state. And so as I run this all the time where clients will tell me, go, well, our experience is whatever. Our our people, our people don't retire at 62. They live, they work until they're 67 or they do this or they do that. And they're guys, you don't have enough credible experience. We want to look at a much bigger pool. So we're looking at state statewide averages or statewide experience studies for really the demographic things of mortality, uh, retirement rates. When are people going to retire? How long are they going to stay employed? Our our non Massachusetts assumptions are really more related to healthcare and the discount rate, which again is using a survey of about thirty five to forty investment advisors, where we get our our rate of return assumptions from. You mentioned um, during Sean on this one. <laughs> just mentioned PERC and uh, might want to say what that is because so, isn't that where yeah we, yeah uh, I'm sorry yeah PERAC so the Public Employee Retirement Administrative Committee it's the state the statewide entity that runs manages all the pension systems in the state um, so they are basically the reporting agency that everybody has to get their assumptions approved by and there are reports and funding schedules approved by so they do um, and they also do a bunch of valuations for a bunch of pension systems as well and they value the state plan and things like that, but they do, they're a large committee that basically runs all this, oversees all the state pension systems, probably the nice way to phrase it. And our OPEP funds are invested with the state retirement yep. trust. Um, yep. So okay. we don't, some some communities have their own individual investment advisors. We've chose um, to go with the state because they've had really good experience and there's, you know, there's logic with going with a larger group that has more, you know, the, the highest level of investment expertise you know in the state so yeah i just wanted to mention that for the committee's sake yeah. because in also to find out if that's still where we were yep yeah we're still there i remember that uh when sandy was uh in your position that was a decision that he recommended to uh the old finance committee and yeah yeah no it makes it makes a lot of sense to stay with them okay Anything else from that the committee wants to ask about OPEB? Uh, uh, Andy, I just want to clarify, do we need some votes on this and the audit report? I don't think there's any votes. It's more, more that we've yeah, we presented it in to the you. Past. We didn't yeah. last year because we just, you know, we get the reports, but we can't reject them. So no. to accept them <laughs> right. doesn't make sense either. Okay. They, the reports are what they are, and we have the responsibility to review them on behalf of the council. That's what our charge is. But then we'll also be putting them in the packet for the council for the next meeting because they will accompany the finance committee report. Is that correct? Uh, we either put them in the packet. I mean, that's something you and I should talk about. Okay. Whether you put them in the packet or just refer to them uh, in the report as being in the uh, packet for this meeting, because in the end, uh, I, I expect very few counselors to actually sit down and look at the entire report and not glaze over. I, I would agree with that. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
So I don't and I, I'm going to sign off and I just want to say thank you and bye to everybody. I didn't want to just sign off and leave without saying something. Oh, I was going to do that. I'm glad you did because <laughs> thank you for being here and thank you for all of your good work over many years and in this past year in getting that audit together and uh, getting Holly ready to take over and um, fill your shoes, which I know was discussed the other day. Yeah, and whether, I just want to say I appreciate you can wear your shoes. I appreciate all the all the um, the feedback on the audit, but I also want to point out that it's really the finance department as a whole, as a team that pulls these audits together, and they deserve as much credit as I do on it all. So I just want to make sure everybody realizes that. But thank you, Holly. Um, I was just going to mention for folks that both the full audit report and the full actuarial report are on the accounting's webpage of the website. So if anybody wants to dig in and read it all, they're both there. Okay, great. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Sonia. Bye. And thank you, Parker, um, again, for uh, your presentation. Again, if there's any other questions that come up, um, yeah, I'll work with you to get the answers and yeah. get it back to the committee. No worries. I just emailed you the presentation. So in every other questions, reach out anytime. Thank you. All right. Thanks, guys. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm I want to close out the meeting as quickly as I can. So I was gonna um uh, try and do one quick thing. Um uh, I can find the uh here's what I want. Um this is the current version of the master plan uh, calendar. I think the, um, the most recent revision date and what's happened in the past is irrelevant, but I wanted to point out that um, we didn't have any financial pieces in uh, the council meeting that we just had. And I don't, I think that we've now um, not placed any in for the 20th, but for the committee meetings, um, the next meeting then, if uh, there's agreement that this is all correct, which is why I wanted to quickly run it by, we um, have the roles here of, um, that are in this section, uh, discuss and recommend action on appropriation and debt authorization for the school project, and um, return back to the counselor compensation discussion. And John, is that still what you think there's a reasonable plan for that meeting? Yeah, um, yeah, uh, that looks good. And if there's anything that comes up on the, you know, we, I think we always leave a placeholder. If there's anything that comes up on the 20th at the council meeting, that that might get added as well. But I think based on what we have right now in front of us, those make sense. Okay, this uh, this, uh, this is being updated whenever it seems appropriate to do it. Yep. Um, and, and Andy, uh, Andy, can I interrupt? So Sean has to run, so he's made me host. Yep. So okay. thanks, Sean. Thank you all. Bye. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Sean. Um, so just real quickly, um, what you see is that uh, it, unless. Uh, there's been a change that the council forum on the appropriation and debt authorization for the school project is set is scheduled for April 3rd. And that's the same meeting where the council would vote on the elementary school building uh, appropriation and debt authorization. And uh, so we have to decide yet whether to post posted also as a finance committee meeting and uh, then uh, we're also be, be getting into the regional school district budget because um, they're going to um, uh, that'll be delivered and uh, by the uh, superintendent and referred um, and uh, so then we that means that at the beginning of April we need to start addressing the regional school budget issues to try and get them out of the way. And I also um, just wanted to say that when we uh, talked about counselor compensation and I was pushing it even though we hadn't till July, 
um, as you start looking at the um, next pages, you realize that by, by, by May 1st, we are getting the budget from the town manager. And then there's a whole series of biweekly meetings uh, that we have uh, uh, for several weeks in order to get um, each of the sections of government. And Sean's already lined those up so that the staff are aware when they would be uh, with us. So um, I will uh, send this out to the committee again in the newest version. If it, I don't think that the newest version has gone out already, but uh, Kathy and uh, then Lynn, let's just see what you want to raise about this. Andy, can you scroll back um, a bit? Just scroll up. Okay, I'm just looking for, um, and Sean has just left. My, my, I think there's plenty of time. Paul, what, what I'm looking for is um, we may get an informal and unofficial more information from MSBA before that. April 26 vote. Okay. And if it's not the same as what our estimate was, I'm looking for when we would talk about that. So that's what I'm looking for in this schedule. That was my question. I think we'd have to see if it's not, it, it looks like the count, the finance committee has a meeting on April 4th and then not another one until April 25th. So we'd have to schedule a special meeting. Yeah. So that's what I'm just saying that I think we, so. Andy, you, you just just think in terms of penciling in something. I just want to hold some things on mine, even if it ends up being that we don't need it. And that the 26th is a Wednesday. That isn't a committee meeting. That will just be, we'll, we'll be reporting out on it. So just people understand that's a date, but it's not a, it's not a meeting. It's not a committee meeting. That's why I wrote MSBA down and didn't put it down as committee or council. Right. So I was just, um, yeah. So that that's all. I was just saying that there there might need to be something between um, the, yes. That I'll stop. That's it. Uh, the twenty sixth date uh, was for Margaret's. Um, oh no, that is an accurate. That's a completely accurate date. It's just Ooh. that um, it it looks like we will have. I'll call it informal. What's unofficial? What's the best way of calling this fall? It's they're, yeah. they're not they're not going to. If they don't completely accept everything that as we submitted, they're going to tell us is what I think. But you don't know the date yet. Correct. Uh, because the problem is, is that, you know, the, the Tuesdays that follow are April 11th and April 18th. And um, I think that April 18th is uh, the vacation week, uh, Patriot's Day week. Um, yes. And it's also uh, the week when um, I think that the, the week four is likely to be when the House Ways and Means budget will come out and we'll have the next um, time to review it. And I think that the other thing that needs to be added to the uh, uh, calendars uh, that Sean had said that he was going to do revisions of the um, FY24 projections uh, based upon the um, governor's uh, proposed budget. And I have to see whether he's going to do that soon or whether he's waiting until after the House Ways and Means budget. And then that has to be plugged into the schedule to lend to you. And then I think we can close it out. Um, yes, April 18th is the school vacation week, but if we needed to meet on that Tuesday, um, we might want to do that. My comment actually was toward the end of the, um, schedule and whether I'm asking you as chair, whether or not you want to schedule those meetings where we're reviewing the town manager's proposed budget as committees of the whole 
And the second is, do you want to hold any of them in the evening? Because I, what I'd like to do is make sure that we start posting them however you would like and with times so that if people want to come to the more thorough discussion with a various departments, they do so. And, and if you could scroll to that, I'm going to miss a few of them too. So I had emailed you at one point. Yes, was, you did. Yeah. Um, the uh, question of uh, putting posting as a committee of the whole, um, we did it last, we, we've done it in the past, solely to cover the possibility that a uh, quorum of the council might show up and then you can't just bring them into the meeting and let them ask questions um, if it takes it over to um, a quorum of the council. Right. So for that reason, we might want to do that. Um, but this section uh, of the report, I didn't think about it because it really came from John. Because yeah. I was trying to put um, everything together in a single document just so that I wouldn't go as crazy this year of trying to keep track of it as I have at times, admittedly. Well, and then I I need to plug this into the overall council agenda documents. So that's one reason why I'm looking at it. Um, I don't think we need to answer that question today, but I do think we should answer it before the end okay. of it. All right. Um, and I think that that's most of what's going on. I think there was one other thing on the agenda I should just report on really quickly, and Anna can help with this too, and then I, I want to adjourn. Um, Sorry, Andy, before you go to that, can I make a comment on this piece? Yes. So I, I do think to Lynn's point about offering up opportunities for input in the evening um, and keeping that in mind as you are looking at the at the scheduling of these, if possible, um, I know I know this is a possibly a painful ask for for folks on the finance committee, but um, if you're able to make at least some of the opportunities beyond just the big budget hearing possibly be in the evening for folks who uh, work during the day, it might it might provide an alternative opportunity for engagement. Um, I, this, it's a vague thought, but I, I hope you'll keep it in mind as you continue to go forward with the schedule. Um, since Sean's not here, I'll just leave it to Paul if he has any comments about that. Uh, and that is that uh, all of those ones that are, have budget sections, Sean had cleared them with uh, department heads that are for the appropriate sections. That's totally fine. I think I'm I'm looking at the um, maybe it's like the finalizing the recommendation. I, I I'm not sure. I'm just trying to think about this. is It's a half formed thought. So I hope folks will have a little patience with me yeah. here. I'm trying to think about the best way to make sure that we've got all of the avenues. And I know that Paul and Sean work really hard on on providing different avenues for feedback. But I, I do think that it can be challenging when everything is during the day other than the one hearing. Um, Unless we I'm can put them at yeah. We can put them at night if the count if the finance committee wants to. It's just we, we can accommodate whatever you think is best. I don't necessarily know that it, that's what I'm I'm recommending. I think I'm just trying to I'm trying to look at this and and see how broad it is in terms of offerings. And it it seems like am I wrong that the only opportunity outside of normal working hours to in person engage on the budget would be the public hearing? Is there another opportunity of that other than that? Let let us let's let's talk it through a little bit and and bring a proposal back next time. I think it's a good idea. And with so the interest from multiple members of the finance committee is, are there some evening meetings that can uh, help the public to engage in it more thoroughly than they can during the day, right? Yes, and I don't. I, again, I'm not saying we should move to that. I think maybe having the option and looking at it next time might be helpful. Okay, we'll do. It might be might be a question to ask council too. Right. Yeah. whether it would help counselors who wish to attend. Um, so why don't we, I'll, I'll look into that. The other thing that I was just going to say is in the water and let me take this down because I, uh, not that I, I don't think we need it anymore um, to be on the screen. Um, the last, uh, the other item on the agenda was water and sewer regulations. 
and um, it's this discussion of council action and town services and outreach committee meeting. Um, and Anna and I were both there. Um, basically, what TSO is planning on doing is working on towards the idea that was discussed when this came before the council and the in the uh, motion was made to uh, not uh, schedule not include it in any change in the regulations that would automatically go into effect that TSO uh, and I think it was the unanimous agreement wants to uh, make a recommendation of what goes into the motion for the council meeting and what was being envisioned was a motion that would uh, have um, set a date by which we recommend that um, staff come back to the council um, two years from now with a recommendation and what we would uh, suggest through that motion being in uh, in that recommendation, what what factors to consider in that recommendation, but um, the the goal is is fairly obvious. And uh, what I said was that I was going to bring this to the attention of this committee, so that um, we would solicit uh, just suggestions from both committees about what might be in that motion. Uh, so. Anna, you can now correct my statement. Nope, I think you got it. I'm I'm in the process of crafting said motion. And then um, what what has been helpful is a member, at least one member of TSO has emailed me specific questions or topics that they'd like to be addressed um, in that in that uh, time frame of study. So if folks could not tell me right now, but if folks could email me um, in the next couple of days would be great about what they'd like to what they'd like to make sure we have answers on um, either specific questions or areas that you'd like to make sure are addressed um, in whatever report comes back to whatever council is here in two years. Um, that would be that would be very helpful. It doesn't necessarily change the crafting of the motion. It changes what I include as the subsequent list after it. Lynn, you're muted. Yeah, and that motion is going to come from TSO. Correct. Do we have we decide whether those regulations have to go back to GOL? I think they do. That's where they are. Okay. You're right. And we also have decided we're going to have a hearing once they come to the council. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Got it. Thank you. Okay, so anything else that anybody wants to raise uh, that they didn't anticipate to in advance, that I didn't anticipate in advance? Seeing none, then I think that uh, we can consider ourselves adjourned. And thank you all. Thank you all. This is a learning curve of the meeting. Have a good <laughs>